The first scripture passage today is a reading from Amos chapter 1, verse 1, and then chapter 6, 1a, and then 4 through 7. <clears throat> the words of Amos, who was among the shepherds of Tekoa, which he saw concerning Israel in the days of King Uzziah of Judea, and in the days of King Jeroboam, son of Joash of Israel, two years before the earthquake. <clears throat> Alas, for those who are at ease in Zion and for those who feel secure on Mount Samaria. Alas, for those who lie on the beds of ivory and the lounge of their couches and eat lambs from the flock and the calves from the stall, who sing idle songs to the sound of the harp, and like David, improvise on instruments of music, who drink wine from bowls and anoint themselves with the finest oils, but are not grieved over the ruin of Joseph. Therefore, they shall now be the first to go into exile. The reverly of the loungers shall pass away. I want to commend Patty there because there were a few names that were a little awkward. I didn't mean to do that intentionally. It was the Bible that did it, but I assigned those readings. The second reading is from the Christian Scriptures, Luke chapter 16, verses 19 through 31. Here Jesus has been telling stories, parables, teaching utensils, if you will. And the scribes and the Pharisees have been carefully, very carefully listening to what he has to say because he has befriended sinners and tax collectors. This may be their chance to catch him to trip him up and use this against him. So it's here that he shares another story that's come to be known as the rich man and Lazarus. Hear these words. There was a rich man who was dressed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, covered with sores, who longed to satisfy his hunger with what fell from the rich man's table. Even the dogs would come and lick his sores. The poor man died and was carried away by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried in Hades, where he, the rich man, was being tormented. He looked up and saw Abraham far away with Lazarus by his side. He called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in agony in these flames. But Abraham said, Child, remember that during your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in agony. Besides all this, between you and us, a great chasm has been fixed, so that those who might want to pass from here to you cannot do so, and no one can cross from there to us. He said, Then, Father, I beg you to send him to my father's house, for I have five brothers that he may warn them so that, they may, so that they will not also come into this place of torment. 
Abraham replied, They have Moses and the prophets. They should listen to them. The rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. Abraham said to him, If they do not listen to Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced, even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. My God, out of the darkness that stalks the night, you have brought light into the morning. In doing so, you pour down on us the light of knowledge and understanding. So we would ask that you would let that light shine upon us this day, not wasting in the noonday heat, but burning in our hearts forever. Amen. Jesus was certainly a wordsmith. And being such a fine wordsmith, his stories would enthrall the listeners. And here he told that yet another story, a story that we have called and dubbed the rich man and Lazarus. It plays out, if you read through it, in four acts. And while I was working on this sermon, I began to see these four acts standing out even more so. And I came to realize that to be fair to the story and to you, the listener, it has to be told in two installments. So today we will be listening to the first installment, the story of Dives and Lazarus, Acts 1 and 2. And then next week we'll pick up on the stories of Dives and Lazarus, Acts 3 and 4. So let's get on with it. Let's go to Act 1. There we have introductions being made. The story introduces us to the two main characters, each experiencing and representing two very dissimilar places, the extremes in life. The first character, I give the name Dives because that's the name we've given to this man from the Latin meaning rich man. He lives in a gated community, self safeguarded from the outside. He's protected, as is his lifestyle. And he feels safe and secure that nothing will be changed. He will be secure in this setting, untouched, undisturbed from the outside. And then there's the second character, Lazarus by name, which is the Hebrew word for God helps. Lazarus is poor, willing to compete with the dogs for table scraps. He was a passive, undemanding person Though he didn't have to be because Jewish law stated that if anyone refused the request of a poor person, they'd have to deal with that person's curse. For a poor, per for a poor person's curse is upheld by God. And even though they lived a stone's throw from one another, these two characters lived in very different worlds. Each represented the extremes of society. 
Jesus told reality stories that spoke of his time. But his stories are easily transferable into our lives today. We too, if we're honest with ourselves, live in our own style of gated communities. We live in relative comfort, yet not far from us, there are those who are socially, educationally, economically, spiritually poor. We can certainly be proud of our accomplishments, but Christ is also saying that just because of what we've accumulated doesn't allow us to neglect or dismiss or cut ourselves off from the realities of our times, the realities of Christ's time. That's Act 1. We move into Act 2 and we suddenly find ourselves seeing a scene change having taken place. Lazarus and Dives have died. Each now finds themselves in another world. Dives was buried in magnificent splendor. All the right people made their obligatory presence and appearance to his funeral. But now he finds himself in Sheol, in hell, in the underworld of the dead. Lazarus, on the other hand, had a pauper's funeral. No one of any importance attended his funeral. But he's now sitting beside Father Abraham in a heavenly banquet feast. How did this happen? How did he get there? Is poverty a virtue? Is being poor better than being rich? None of this seems to make sense on first reading it, does it? Lazarus is with Abraham because God helps those who call upon their God in times of distress. That's the divine's way of working with us. It's got nothing to do with classism, with rich and poor. Jesus is above all of that. It has to do with humility, respect, and reverence. Okay, we get why Lazarus is where he is, but... Why is, why is Dives in Sheol, in hell? Is it because he's wealthy? Well, Father Abraham was wealthy. Is it because of his taste in clothes? <laughs> I certainly hope not. Is it because he enjoys gourmet food? Oh, I... <laughs> I certainly hope not on that account. No, none of those reasons hold water. I think we get the answer from the conversation that takes place between Dives and Abraham. Listen again to that one line, that one part of a verse. Dives calls up to Abraham, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus. Do you get it? It's right there. It's right before us. It's easy to miss, but it's, that's the point. Dives acknowledges having known Lazarus by name. That's the twist that Jesus throws into this story. Dives knew Lazarus from before their death. From when they lived on earth. And it's Dives' failures in Act 2 that are directly related to his failure in Act 1. 
He's lying in his own bed, the bed he made for himself. And that bed for him is in Sheol, in hell. Divey's new Lazarus while on earth, earth, but chose to ignore his pleas for compassion. He had surrounded himself with the things all of us want that remind us and tell us and others that we have arrived. Maybe Divey's had a full life. Maybe he had a house full of servants. Maybe he was married and had a large family. We don't know that. But we do know that he lived by himself for himself. You know, aloneness is the loneliest of lonelies. Divey's tragedy is that he lived a lonely life, isolating himself from the pain and condition of a neighbor. He lived in what I refer to as a relational vacuum. Or as others say, he lived by the law of impersonal. Divies and Lazarus needed each other. As do all of us. Like Lazarus, who needed human compassion, so we need kindness and compassion from others, don't we? And like Dives, who needed human companionship, so we need the sense of belonging, the sense of companionship from others, don't we? But let's be careful here. We don't want to be too quick to judge Dives. I don't think he was as evil or intentionally cruel a person as he may initially appear. I think he was simply ignorant. Self-centered. A hollow soul. Who couldn't see what was directly in front of him. Does that sound familiar to you? Of course it does. Some of us have been accused of having selective hearing. Not me, but some of us. But I think all of us can say that at one time or another, we've struggled with selective seeing. And it's when we can acknowledge this weakness of ours that we can then begin to start a healing process and try to deal with what's infected our lives. That's what Divey needs to do. But I don't want to go any farther here because there's much more to be said. And one of the amazing, illuminating things about the parables of Jesus is that they're packed with so much information so many suggestions on life skills, so many golden nuggets. And this is where I show my compassion to you. I create an intermission between Acts 1 and 2 and Acts 3 and 4. So next week, we'll pick up on, now this dates me, Paul Harvey's the rest of the story. Next week, we'll listen to the stories of Dives and Lazarus, Acts 3 and 4. Amen. Let us pray. Loving God, we thank you for illuminating for us what is so important in our lives. And we would ask that 
as we move through the week, we be a little more sensitive and a little more aware of what is before us so that we might respond in kind. Amen. And now let us affirm our faith using the confession of Belhar as we stand and join our voices together in saying, As the one who wishes to bring about justice and true peace among people, the God in a world full of injustice and enmity is in a special way the God of the destitute, the poor, and the wrong. The God wishes to teach the church to do what is good and to seek the right, that the church must therefore stand by people in any form of suffering and need, which implies, among other things, that the church must witness against and survive any form of injustice, so that injustice may go down and righteousness